Thank you. Next out of business is topical questions. Question one, Jim Hume. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the latest reports on waiting times to access support services that allow older people to live independently at home. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. <coughs> Presiding officer, we're aware that a number of areas are experiencing difficulty providing suitable care in the community. We recently allocated £5 million additional funding for 2014-15 to the health boards that face the most significant pressures on delayed discharges. This funding will enable them to accelerate progress towards sustainable change, drive down delayed discharge numbers and enhance rehabilitation services and community care capacity. Uh, Jim I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and, uh, and recognise that he recognises that there is still work to, to be done. The Scottish Government states on its website that in order to achieve its 2020 vision for the NHS, there will be a focus on supported self-management. However, we've learned that some people are waiting for up to 36 weeks for rehabilitation services that the Scottish Government is aiming to deliver within four weeks by the end of 2016. Patients can't begin their self-management without such intervention. Professor Paul Knight of the British Could we get a question, Geriatric Mr. Society Hume? Of course, uh, stated that to make an intervention worthwhile and effective, you need to reach the individual as early as you can make it. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the Government is failing in its attempts to ensure elderly but frail people can live more independently? Cabinet Secretary. No, Presiding Officer, we're putting a record amount of resources into this whole area, but let me say I do recognise there are some parts of the country where there are pressures, particularly in, say, for example, parts of Fife, parts of Glasgow and elsewhere, and we are working with the respective health boards and the respective local authorities to address these issues, and indeed we're working with COSLA. We have recently commissioned with COSLA a follow-up to re report to the review of residential care to look at care at home services because we both reckon that some of the problems associated with residential care are also uh, similar to the challenges and problems faced in parts of the care at home sector. This better be brief, Mr Hume. Uh, it shall be, and thank you very much. Uh, I recognise the, the, the review that you mentioned there, but will the Cabinet Sec Secretary commit to a full review of the provision of rehabilitation services across the country and consider bringing forward his target from 2016 to get a real grip on this problem? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, as part of the report commissioned jointly by COSLA and ourselves, they will be looking at rehabilitation services as part of that review because uh, very clearly uh, care at home services are an important element of rehabilitation. I do absolutely agree with Mr Hume about our concerns in those areas where there are pressures, but working with COSLA, the local authorities and the health boards, and with the additional money that we have put in, we are actually doing everything we possibly can to substantially reduce the waiting time where it's far too long. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there is a lack of funding to provide support and rehabilitation services due to cuts in council budgets. This has led to bed blocking in many areas with the NHS struggling to cope. He will also be aware of issues regarding inadequate care when it is available with 15 minute or less care visits. While we welcome the additional funding, it is a drop in the ocean of need. Will he now agree with us that we need a comprehensive beverage style review of the NHS to make sure that there is adequate care? available for older people to live independently and securely in our communities. Cabinet Presiding Officer, the beverage uh, report was not a review, it was a plan, and it's a plan that we are going to produce for 2020, building in our 2020 vision, and at the core of that vision is treating people as much as possible at home or in the community in a homely setting. And as the member knows, I've held discussions with other parties, including representatives from the Labour Party, and offered them the opportunity to come up with their ideas on the 2020 plan. To date, I've heard nothing from the Labour Party. Neil Finn. <laughs> President officer, this report combined with the crisis in social care means that more and more people are stuck in hospital when they should be living independently at home. Why do the figures uh, released today and the standard of care services continue to deteriorate under his stewardship? Cabinet Secretary. 
Presenting officer, as usual, Mr Finlay doesn't get confused by the facts. The reality is that the average stay in hospital today is at a record low. So by definition, people cannot be generally stuck in hospital. Now, there is a problem with delayed discharges, but we have significantly reduced delayed discharges since this government was in power. And in fact, we have now got amongst the lowest, not the lowest, but amongst the lowest, if you look at it historically, level of delayed discharges in Scotland. There are still challenges to get to where we want to be. And indeed, if we were able to get delayed discharges to the level we want them to be, which we intend to do over the next two or three years, that will release £100 million additional resources for investment in other priorities, either in the community or in the hospital se sector. But Mr Finlay should recognise the challenges that we face as a result of the massive cuts in our budget made by the Westminster Tory government that he's in cahoots with to get a no vote. Question two, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it considers the economic impact will be of Royal Mail's decision to bring forward rural postbox collection times. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, postal services are a vital lifeline for many of Scotland's businesses and communities, particularly in some of the nation's more remote rural areas. Many businesses, presiding officer, depend on the timely uplift of mail from post boxes, which is why it is worrying to learn of Royal Mail's plans to bring forward collection times for many post boxes. Rob Gibbs. I thank the Minister for his answer, but uh, I have some information that Royal Mail has also been discussing further cuts in rural services by making postal collections every second day. I wonder if the Minister could find out if this is true and if uh, this is another example of undermining the universal uh, uh, postal service. Fergus Ewing. Well, we would be very concerned if there were further diminutions to the service, especially of those in rural areas who already enjoy a, a, a lower service than before, as Mr Gibson has rightly highlighted. I will therefore, as he requests, make inquiries by writing to the Royal Mail on the particular point that the member raises. However, it does seem self-evident, presiding officer, that we in this chamber do not have any power or control uh, over these matters because the Royal Mail is not accountable directly to this body. We are not therefore able to give, uh, to give uh, vent and, and support to the wishes of the people of Scotland, 72% yep. of whom oppose the privatisation of the Royal Mail. We are powerless to prevent that unless or until we have the power and the choice to determine these matters in this place. Rob Gibbs. I thank the Minister for that answer. You know, if an independent Scotland is able to uh, gain uh, public ownership of the Royal Mail, will this restore postal services to both rural and urban addresses to a level that does not disadvantage these communities and businesses in the future? Minister. Well, I, I think that, uh, that would be for the first parliament in independent Scotland to determine. But I do believe that uh, any government in a Scottish parliament elected and accountable to the people for these matters would have a stronger desire and wish to ensure that a fairer service is provided to all our customers by a Scottish Royal Mail. Question three, John Scott. Guiding officer, um, to ask the Scottish Government what precautions it is taking to reduce the threat of the Ebola virus. Mr Michael Matheson. Since the start of the outbreak in Western Africa, we've been working closely with Health Protection Scotland to minimise the risk of Ebola to Scotland. Health Protection Scotland routinely monitor global disease outbreaks and the risk from Ebola is currently assessed as very low. No cases have been reported in Scotland or elsewhere in the UK. Scotland has well-developed procedures in place to respond to this type of situation. The NHS in Scotland safely managed a case of viral hemorrhagic fever in a patient in Glasgow in 2012, and our recent experience during the Commonwealth Games further strengthened these procedures. As a result, we are better placed than many other parts of the UK to respond to suspected cases of Ebola virus. However, given the situation in Western Africa, a number of additional steps are being taken. We are liaising with other governments across the UK to ensure a coordinated response, particularly in managing suspected cases. Updated guidance has been provided to UK border agency staff who may encounter travellers returning from Western Africa 
and Health Protection Scotland is producing a poster which will be displayed in hospital in airports and ports advising travellers on precautions against Ebola should they be travelling to an affected area. Professional guidance has been updated and revised, and GPs and other healthcare workers throughout Scotland have been notified to be extra vigilant when dealing with patients who have recently travelled to the affected areas. In the last fortnight, we have asked all NHS boards across Scotland to confirm they have arrangements in place to deal with any suspected cases of Ebola, and all have provided assurances that they are prepared. Finally, a short life working group has been established which will bring together relevant Scottish agencies, including the Scottish Government, to consider if anything more needs to be done. I am personally meeting with Health Protection Scotland next week to discuss this further, and I am confident that the risk to the people of Scotland remains very low, and the NHS stands ready to respond to any suspected cases of Ebola. John Scott. I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive answer. Uh, I would ask, has the issue been discussed at Cabinet, although I suspect I know the answer, uh, what discussion has taken place between the World Health Organisation and the Scottish Government about the risks, and what is the Government view on the use of the experimental drug ZMAP, if I pronounced it correctly, should a treatment for Ebola be required in Scotland, and has any evaluation of ZMAP been made by sign should this drug be required? Minister. Well, I can confirm to the member that the uh, issue of Ebola was discussed at the Cabinet today, and the Scottish Government continued through Health Protection Scotland to liaise with the other international parties, including the World Health Organisation, around the state of preparedness we require. Of course, the World Health Organisation have declared it uh, a public health emergency of international concern, and we are responding to it on that particular basis. The member raised the issue about the uh, experimental uh, vaccine. Uh, although there are no vaccines uh, against Ebola at this particular point, uh, the World Health Organization is considering the possible use of uh, this particular experimental uh, drug for patients uh, who have contracted Ebola. We will uh, continue to liaise with the World Health Organization and to operate in the advice that they provide us around this matter. But clearly, this would be a matter that has to consider a number of very detailed and complex ethical issues. Uh, because of the experimental nature of this drug. And once the World Health Organisation have come to a decision on that, we will consider what any further ma matters have to be put in place here in Scotland. John Scott. Thank you. Um, where would people be treated if a case or cases of Ebola were to be found in Scotland? And would any special measures be taken to protect medical and hospital staff if cases of Ebola were to be discovered in Scotland? Minister. Well, we have... Uh, uh, it's a, a ready specialist protocol for dealing with any type of uh, uh, significant contagious disease. As I mentioned in my opening response, uh, uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, dealt with a case of Crimean Congo viral haemorrhagic fever in 2012. Uh, where the protocol which was used for dealing with these types of illnesses uh, uh, was utilised. That particular uh, patient was uh, dealt with in the Brownlee uh, Hospital Unit, which is a special unit for uh, contagious uh, diseases. So we have protocols in place uh, for dealing with patients who potentially could have uh, a disease such as Ebola. Uh, we have the facilities in place in order to deal with any patients who may require uh, treatment. And we also have arrangements in place to make sure there's proper protection uh, for our medical staff who may be uh, treating uh, patients who have such a condition. As I mentioned in the checks that we've made with our health boards, they have all confirmed that they have sufficient uh, personal protection equipment in place uh, to deal with any patients who may be suspected of having Ebola. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10769 in the name of John Swain on economic opportunity for independence. And I will give a few moments for uh, people to change their seats. <laughs>